again, guests, we want to welcome all of you here. We want to welcome also our audience that's watching online. We want to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Um, again, like Christine said, it's, it's, maybe it's been a, a great week for you. Maybe it's been a challenging week for you. Um, and so I know that there sometimes it's been, it's like everything just goes perfectly according to plan. And then uh, sometimes nothing goes the way that you have planned. Anybody ever had one of those weeks? Anybody had that week this week? <laughs> like everything that you planned, uh, it just didn't work out. Uh, but we've got a God, honestly, like Christine was saying, a God that loves us. And we want to talk about that God this morning. We want to talk about Jesus Christ uh, this morning. The, uh, the message is titled, uh, Committed to Memory. Now, how many of you remember the game Memory? Anybody remember, remember playing that game as a kid, right? You remember playing the game? You can see the picture up there. And uh, you had the game pieces were just basically square pieces that had pictures on one side. And then on the other side, it was just, uh, just blank. And uh, so you start the game with all the pictures facing down, and they're all scrambled around, and you get them in line, and, and then you go and you, each person, let's say there's four people, but each person goes and they flip over one card, and then they flip over another. Now, obviously, in the beginning, you don't know where any of the cards are. You haven't been able to see any of those cards. Um, but as people start taking turns, you start seeing, oh, wait, this person flipped over the flower, and I remember the flower was somewhere over here. Sometimes you get lucky, right? Sometimes you get lucky at the beginning of the game. Or, or maybe uh, uh, somewhere where a picture that hasn't been turned over and you get the other one on the spot. I mean, that's just luck. But usually we have to remember like, oh, wait, where was that picture again? How many of you would say you just have a great memory? I mean, you, you've played some of the luminosity, or luminosity games, those brain games, especially those memory games. You're just like, man, I'm just smoking through this thing. And actually, if you love the game memory, you could actually, they've got an app for that. You could actually go and download, uh, they've got several different ones, but you can play the game memory, play it with others. Uh, I remember uh, a little while ago, uh, my mom and I, uh, we were having just kind of a family get together. And uh, I had it already on my iPad, and, and so I brought it over to my mom, and I'm like, hey, check this out. Remember when we used to play this? You know, when we were kids, and that, was, it, that was our jam, man. Memory. We loved memory. And so I brought it, brought it to my mom, and my mom just like, oh, my goodness, you know, I can't believe this. Yeah, we used to play this all the time. And, and well, in this, the app game, you're trying to do it as fast as you can. You're trying to, you're trying to see who can get the best time. So you've got the one person, and this one, uh, the first one that I gave her, you know, I wanted to start, it off, start her off easy. And so I think it had maybe like 10 pieces or something like that. And so she's going through it, got through it quick. So then I took her over to the, like, the 24-piece one. You know, and now she's like really thinking like, oh man, where was that? Where was it? Oh, I saw, I think I saw that one. But you're trying to do it as fast as you can. And some of us are just, I mean, man, we just see a picture. We know where it's at. It just fits right in and we can just remember it. And some of us, I mean, we don't remember things from last year, like just general stuff from last year. I mean, how many of you have trouble remembering just, just regular stuff that happened last year? I mean, how many of you have trouble remembering stuff just three months ago? How, how many of you have trouble memorizing or remembering things just yesterday? Well, what, what, did you get drunk or something? I mean, how could you not remember what happened yesterday, you know? My wife has an incredible memory. Christine has an incredible memory. Like, she'll just dig up stuff from her childhood, and she'll remember, like, not only that she went to third grade, she'll remember her third grade teacher, and she'll remember her third grade teacher's name. And then she'll say, oh, yeah, and I had these classmates, and she'll start naming them off. I just remember that I went to third grade, you know? I don't know who my, I mean, I guess I remember something else. I was held back in third grade. You know, but it's like, I don't remember that stuff. I don't remember details like that. I mean, she'll pull those things out and it's like, how do you remember that stuff? I want to talk about memory this morning and how that ties in to our relationship with God and, and also how it just ties into life in general as far as memory goes. Um, let's go back a little bit in, in, in the Bible, back in, in history a little bit. Uh, we've been talking a little over the last several weeks with Moses, Adam and Eve, you know, just the kind of Israel coming out of slavery and all of those things. 
Well, go all the way back. I think we did this last week. Go all the way back to Adam and Eve. God creates a perfect world. Adam and Eve live in this perfect world. Then they decide to slap God in the face and say, hey, we're going to do our own thing. That's how sin enters into the world. Man uh, turns away from God. Sin enters into the world. Fast forward a few years. Abraham steps on the scene. A guy by the, by the name of Abraham. His name was Abram at first. God changed his name to, to Abraham, which just simply meant that he's a father of nations. Okay? Now, the, the funny thing about Abraham's name is that when God gave him that name, uh, Abraham didn't have not one son. Abraham didn't have not one heir, nobody to pass on his legacy. And so everywhere that he went, he would say, he would introduce himself, just like we would. When we meet somebody for the first time, we say, hey, my name is Josh, what's your name? Well, especially in those times, names carried meaning to him. And so Abraham, every time he would introduce himself, he would say, hi, I'm father of many nations. And the people that he would be introduced to, or that he would introduce himself to, they'd be like, oh, you don't have any sons. Or maybe people that knew him around him that were just like, well, father of nations, you don't have any sons. Now, there's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about that. That we're able to, we were talking about words a couple weeks ago, that we're able to speak those things that are not as though they are, especially the things that God wants to do in our lives, especially the promises that God has made to us in our lives, concerning our lives, concerning our marriage or our career, whatever it might be, that God is speaking life and that God has promises for us. And sometimes we don't see those things, right? I mean, sometimes those things aren't coming to pass. Sometimes we're just wondering, hey, does God even care? Does God even see me? Does God see the crazy week that I have? Does God even know me anymore? But we have to be reminded that just as Abraham, he just said, hey, I'm the father of many nations. I don't see it right now. I'm the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. And before you know it, that's exactly what God created. Uh, Abraham had a very late age in his life. I believe Abraham was 100 years old. I believe his wife was 90. Can you imagine when, uh, ladies being pregnant at 90? Whoa. Um, and so she's pregnant at 90, and, and they have a son. And from that son, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation of Israel is formed. God's people. And, and when I say God's people, it was God's people. Back in the Old Testament, it was God's people that, not that God hated every other people, but God started with one man, because everything fell apart with Adam and Eve, and it just continued to fall apart. The flood is all in there and all that other stuff. But everything fell apart, and then God chose Abraham and said, I'm going to build a nation from you, and I'm going to start with this nation to be able to impact the entire world. And so through uh, Abraham, God creates, forms this nation. And, and Abraham basically lives up to his name, that he is a father of not just one nation, but of many nations. Every one of us, especially if we call ourselves Christians, we go back to Abraham and him believing God and God's promises and standing on it. And that's the same way that we stand on God's promises by faith, that we're saved, that we've been forgiven of our sins, that we're set free, and that we're going to spend eternity with God through Jesus Christ. Well, another guy steps on the scene, fast forward, Moses steps on the scene. And at this time, Israel is in captivity. They're in captivity, and, um, and now God is ready to deliver them. God is ready to set them free. And God uses this man, Moses, to deliver Israel out of Egypt's bondage or, or uh, slavery in Egypt. And incidentally, let me just stop right there for a second. Uh, if, you've got your, if you've got your mobile phone, uh, you've got your phone there. Uh, if you've got the Bible app, you can go to the Bible app. You can actually see our live event uh, on, the, on the Bible app. When you go to the, to the Bible app, just click on live events, uh, search for live events, and uh, you'll see live wire experience, all the notes, everything that I'm going to talk about. And let me just encourage you, especially if you, I mean, it, it, it's just like normal as far as we're just texting constantly and constantly and all of that thumbing and all of that stuff. Let me just encourage you to uh, take some notes, man. And we're going to come back to that in just a few moments. Anything that you hear that God speaks to you personally or for your family or for related to your job or your finances, whatever it might be, man, write that thing down. Write it down. Type it in because it's something that you will remember just by simply writing it down. Talking about memory this morning. 
So God uses Moses, right? God uses Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage or to deliver uh, the children of Israel out of slavery. And it's the same, the same is true for us. And actually that story, that real event is symbolic of where you and I have been set free through Jesus Christ, that we've been set free from sins, uh, from sin, sin slavery, from being in bondage to sin, that we have been enslaved to sin, and God, through Jesus Christ, has set us free. That Jesus has redeemed us, that Jesus has forgiven us of all of our sins, that we have been forgiven. And so there again, where God starts out with a nation and then uh, continues on and, and, and all of humanity is, is blessed by this, uh, this salvation, this eternal life, this, uh, this being set free, forgiven of our sin, that's what Jesus Christ did for us. Now, when God brought uh, Israel out of uh, Egypt... God started talking with them and, and, and started instructing them on how to survive. He started giving them principles and started giving them some direction and started giving them guidance so that they would survive not only as, as a nation, but that they would survive as a people. God started giving them some direction related to life. And it's the same thing for us, isn't it? I mean, here's this God like Christine's talking about. And, and he's, he's just saying, hey, I've got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I've got it all under control. All right, just let me, let me get you from this danger spot. Maybe it's, maybe it's some type of sin. Maybe it's some type of situation in our life. Maybe it's some type of circumstance like that chicken is in the, in the branch and it thinks that it's safe when in reality it's really not because an animal like a raccoon or something along those lines can climb up it and, and, and get one of the chickens. And so God's saying, listen, let, just, just come with me. Let me deliver you here and let me bring you to a place that is, that is just flowing. God actually, or the children of Israel actually, actually describe it as a place of milk and honey. In other words, it was just a place that was just blessing. I mean, the food was great. The, the ground was great. Everything about it was great. And this, friends, is what God has for our lives. This is what God has for us. So now we pick up kind of this, uh, this story. We pick up where Moses is reminding the children of Israel of the things that God, have, God has said. And we pick this up in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses uh, writes, Moses is credited for writing the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And so Moses again is speaking and he reminds the children of Israel. He says, never forget, we're talking about memory, right? Never forget the day you stood in front of the Lord, your God, at Mount Horeb. Now, uh, it's related, or it's uh, Mount Horeb, but it's also uh, called Mount Sinai as well. Now, what happened here is when God was giving the children of, of uh, Israel directions, um, he did it in a very awesome, awesome way, or one of the ways that he did this. He did it in a very awesome way. God actually told Moses, he said, I want you to gather everybody. And notice this. The Lord had said to me, assemble the people in front, of, in front of me, and I will let them hear my words. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live on earth, and they will teach their children the same things. So in other words, they're going to learn from God, and then they're going to pass it on to their children. They're going to learn from God, and then they're going to pass it on to their children. What does life actually mean? Pass it on to my children. How, how do I have the very best life on this earth? Pass it on to my children. How do I survive in this life? Pass it on to my children. That's what God intended, to, to just this constant flow from generation to generation that it would be passed down. Well, God does this in an awesome way. And the way that God does it is he tells Moses, hey, assemble the people at the foot of the mountain. Make sure they don't touch the mountain because they'll, they'll just die by my glory and my, my holiness. And God, he's spirit, right? God, you can't see God. But God comes down in the form of fire on this mountain. And this, this fire is just, I mean, you could see it for miles. I mean, this fire is just huge. And then from this fire is just smoke, you know, just like something would burn. Uh, that fire is probably just smoking the ground, smoking all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the plants and the trees. And, and just this uh, the, the smoke is rising up in the air. And then on top of that, the mountain is just shaking violently. I mean, can you imagine if you were there? Maybe you've had the privilege of just seeing on TV a volcano erupting. Or maybe you've really had the privilege of actually being there and seeing a volcano erupting. It would be something similar to that, but even not even close. 
But just like a volcano, you're watching this volcano and, and just that lava just starts throwing up in the air and, and you just see this, just this redness and this yellowish color and, and you just see smoke just start billowing in the air and, and, and the volcanoes just go into town. I mean, it's, it's rumbling and all this other stuff. Well, that's kind of the picture of what they had. And not just that, but here's this mountain. I mean, it's shaking violently like an earthquake. And then fire is just, I mean, it's just rising and smoke is rising, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, God begins to speak. And God just starts talking and starts telling the children of Israel, I want you to survive. I want you to have life. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be prosperous. I want you to be successful. Here's what you need to do in order for that to happen. See, God cares. God cares. God not only cared about the children of Israel, but God cares about us today. God cares about our lives. Think about this for a moment. If God didn't care about the nation of Israel, the people that he decided to build a nation from and that he decided to start with as far as bringing salvation to all of humanity to all of mankind that God started with with them I mean if God didn't care why deliver them out of slavery like why bother with that like it's if, if God if they got into bondage got into slavery by themselves and and they screwed up and they messed up and whatever and they just kind of did their own thing walked away from God if God didn't care why deliver them out of Egypt why deliver them out of slavery if God didn't care about you and I why so love the world that he would send his only son to live a perfect life that we can't live and to be punished that we deserve and not only that but to be nailed to a cross to die on that cross for your sin for my sin for the sin of the entire world if God didn't care see God does care and, and here's the problem. The problem is this, is that so often we look at the Bible, whether we're Christian, it happens to us as Christians, or, or even if we're, we're not a Christian, we look at the Bible and we just say, well, you know, there's God. Here he goes. He's got rules and rules and rules and rules, and God just wants me to follow rules, 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 and rules. And what we take as God just wanting to follow a bunch of just religious rules well, we, well, we, when we take that as just like, it's just a bunch of religious rules that God wants me to follow, when in reality, God is giving us the tools, giving us the resources, giving us the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom to be able to have the very best life that we can live on this earth. Because He cares. He cares. He cares about your marriage, those of you that are married. He cares about your friendships. He cares about the serious relationship that you're in with a significant other. He cares about your finances. He cares about my finances. He cares about your health. He cares about my health. And so throughout the Bible, throughout the Word of God, God gives us this knowledge, understanding, and wisdom to be able to take and say, okay, all right, so that's what, that's what I need in order, to, in order to have a healthy lifestyle. All right, these are the things that I need to stay away from because they're going to be destructive to my life. God warns us of the things that are going to be destructive to our life because he cares. He cares about us. He loves us. And so God speaks through this mountain and starts giving Israel, here's, here's my instructions. Here's the directions that I want you to follow. And Moses, again, is reminding, remember, remember at the mountain? I mean, I don't even know, how, how, could you, how could you forget that? How could you forget an experience like that? When we talk about like, okay, remembering things and maybe some stuff that we don't remember, but then things that are significant moments in our lives, right? Significant times in our lives. Maybe we achieved something. Maybe it was graduation or maybe we hit a home run when we were, when we were playing t-ball. I don't know if you can hit a home run playing t-ball, but... But we did something, and, and we could think back, and we're just like, yeah, I remember achieving that. Like, I remember graduating. I remember just hitting that home run. I remember just accomplishing. I remember just being at the top of my class. I remember getting this uh, award. And then there's also those, in the sense, those negative moments where maybe there's that remembering of an abuse that happened in our life, or maybe there's that m remembrance of a significant uh, uh, or a, a family member or a friend that has passed on, that's gone to be with the Lord. And, and those things, we remember those significant events. 
And, and it's weird because it's like, how would you forget this? But yet, Israel does. Moses continues on, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 32 and 33. So be careful, he goes on. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Never stop living this way. In other words, commit it to memory. When we hear that phrase, hey, take that and commit it to memory, right? What does that mean? It just simply means remember what I'm telling you. Remember the, the, the instruction that I'm giving you. Remember the training that I'm giving you. Commit that to memory. Memorize that. Remember it. And so he says, so be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Never stop living this way. Commit it to memory. Follow all the directions. Follow all the directions the Lord your God has given you. Then you will continue to live. Notice this. Follow all of that stuff. Not because they're just rules. Not just because I want to make life a living hell for you on earth. That it has nothing to do with that. I want you to follow the directions that I'm giving you, that God's given you. Then you will continue to live. Life will go well for you. And you will live a long time in the land that you are going to possess. Notice that. See, God loves. And God cares. And God wants life for every single area of our life. Now, when we look at the end of this verse, right? I mean, how many of us... We want to continue to live. It's like, yeah, you know, I want to be here tomorrow. I, I want to be here next week. I want to be here a month from now. I want to be here a year from now. I want to live a long life. Notice that. He says, man, you follow the directions. You continue in this way. You never give it up. Never stop living this way, and you will continue to live, and life will go well for you. Now, that doesn't mean that life will be perfect, but life will truly go well for you. That means even when everything is just awesome, it's like life is just well. It's like definitely in those times, life is good, man. Life is awesome. But even in the times where things are rough and, and times where things are hard and, and you're going through a, a bad situation and a bad circumstance in your life, that still life will go well for you. Because uh, Paul reminds us of this. He says that all things will work together for good to those who uh, love him and who are called according to his purpose. I was listening to uh, Perry Noble, he's a, the pastor of New Spring Church, and he was talking about this whole concept of all things working, and he said, if it ain't good as far as what's going on in our life, and excuse the English, but if it ain't good, God ain't done. Like right now, if it ain't good in your life, if there's a bad situation, if you're going through something tough, if you're going through something hard, you're looking for a job, or your marriage is on the rocks, if it ain't good, God isn't done. He's not through because the thing is, God is good. God's not good and bad. That's not God. God is good and God's always good. And, and sometimes we just wrestle with that because we're just like, well, if God's good, why is, this, why is this bad thing going on in my life? If it ain't good, God's not done yet. There may be something he's trying to teach me through this situation. There may be something that he's trying to, trying to grow up in me through the situation. It might be patience, which a lot of us may need. And so we need to be in that traffic. And so we can learn a little bit of patience, you know. We need to have that child that just constantly crying or is all over the place so we can have that patience. God wants to teach us. He wants to teach us patience. But God cares. God loves. God's always good. God has nothing but life, perpetual life. In fact, when you look up the word eternal life that we often see in, in the New Testament, when you, when you see that word eternal life, that word eternal is not just talking about a day, a time out there in the distance. Like we know those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our life, we know that we're going to spend eternity with God instead of et spending eternity away from God. But it's not just eternity as in when I die, then I'll be with the Lord. But actually eternal life, when you look it up in its original language, it means perpetual life. It means ongoing life. In other words, the day that I accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of my life was the day that life really started happening. And now, yeah, there's, there is now understanding that, okay, God, wh what is it that you have for me? What does your word say? What does the Bible say about life and all of those things? But God, his intention for every single one of us, 
His intention for following his instructions, just like the children of Israel, his intention for them following the directions, following instructions, is so that they can have ongoing perpetual life. God's intentions for us following the word of God, following the Bible, his intention for us is so that we can experience ongoing perpetual life. And let me make a statement here. We give it up so we can live it up. Because that's what God wants for us. God wants you and I to live it up. I mean, if there's anybody that should be having a party every single day of their life, it should be Christians, really. Honestly, it should be people that trust in God. It should be people that have given their lives to Jesus and that are allowing him to be the primary influence in their life. We should be the ones partying every single day. I mean, we shouldn't be dreading like, oh, man, yeah, I got to follow this rule. I got to do this. Oh, man, you mean I got to do this? I got to do that? But we should actually be living it up. We give it up in order to live it up. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking with that, with that statement. Oh, yeah, I know. Here, here it is. I know, Josh, you're getting ready to drop it. God's going to want me to give up all this stuff. Here it is. I told you. That's why he wants me to follow the instructions. That's why God wants to give all these rules and give me all these regulations because he wants, to, wants me to give up a bunch of stuff. God has never will never ask you to give up something that is good for you. He's never going to ask you to give up something that is beneficial to your life. The only things that God that you're giving up are the things that are destructive in your life. Things that will mess up your life. That will mess up my life. And we all, we all know some of those things. At least some of them. We know, we look back at our, our past and we can pick out some of those things. We can pick out just bad behaviors that we had. Maybe we learned growing up from our parents. Maybe we learned from friends, school, whatever. But we could go back and look back at our, our history and we could say, yeah, you know, I know that, I know I've had some bad behaviors. But God has never, will never ask you to give up something that is so good for you. He's only coming to you and saying those things that are going to destroy you. Why? Because, see, God wants you to survive. But he doesn't just want you to survive. He wants you and I to live it up. He wants you and I to enjoy it, to live life to the fullest. Get this. Get this. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, the reason I'm here, I came to this earth to give them life and life to the fullest. I mean, that's an amazing statement, especially for those of us that just think that it's just about rules and it's just about regulations and it's just about God wanting us to just do stuff. Jesus said, hey, I'm not like the thief that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came, I'm here to bring life and to give them that life to the fullest. That's what God has for every single one of us. Now, there was a, a writer one of the author of one of the psalms, we don't know exactly uh, who the author of this particular psalm is, he kind of goes back to this time of when Israel, uh, uh, when God spoke to him and, and God did these amazing things, and he, he mentions something here, he or, he or she mentions something here, that again, going back to memory, we're talking about memory, Psalms 106, 19 through 21, at Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, they made a statue of a calf, they worship an idol made of metal. They traded their glorious God for the statue of a bull that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, the one who did spectacular things. Notice that. They forgot God. Remember I said a few moments ago, how do you forget? Like, how, how do you forget just that amazing thing that happened? How, how do you forget that? Like God is coming out on fire and he's smoking, man. This mountain is shaking. All this stuff is, is happening. God speaks like, how do you forget that? How is that forgotten? There's, like, there's no way. Like how is that? How do you forget that? Well, the way that it gets forgotten is the same way that it gets forgotten in our own life, in our lives. Sin has this way of tempting us and drawing us away to, to the extent that we forget about God. And not only that, life. Life itself, with situations and circumstances, life has a way of distracting us and, and getting our attention off of God. 
Life has a way of doing that. And so you got sin that's constantly trying to tempt us, and you got just life because, again, sin is in, uh, in the world, and sin has saturated this world, and so there's a lot of bad things that are happening, a lot of perverse things, a lot of wicked things, and, and all that stuff. But even just situations and circumstances, people that are screwing us over, people that are trying to hurt us, and, and just, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. So you've got sin that's constantly trying to tempt us, and then you've got life that will constantly distract us. And they were distracted. See, the children of Israel came to the place where they heard God, and they got afraid. And they were just like, the leaders ran to Moses, like, Moses, listen, man, you need to go up and just talk to God. Because, I mean, if we hear God one more time speak, we're going to go nuts. I mean, we're just, we're just totally, utterly afraid to hear the voice of God again. And so actually Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. Moses goes up on the mountain, and in the midst of this time, they don't know how long he's going to be gone. They don't know when. He didn't say. Moses didn't even know. He said, hey, Aaron, you're in charge. I'm going to go spend some time with God. I'm going to bring his word back to, back to you. I'm going to go chill out. I'm going to go hang out with God. We're going to go uh, just, uh, just hang out together, and, and, and I'll bring word back to you. If, if I can, I'll try to tweet it or put it on my Facebook page. But Moses, I'm going to get it back to you. Or, or Aaron, I'm going to get it back to you. Well, they don't know how long Moses is going to be gone. He didn't even know. And so now they're getting to the point where they're kind of wondering, hey, where's Moses? We don't even know what's happened to him. We don't even know what's going on. So they go to Aaron. They say, hey, you know what? We need to do something. We just need to, we just need to make a God. We need to make a God and, and say, hey, this is the God that has delivered us out of Egypt. You know how crazy, I mean, think about that for a moment. You know how crazy that is? They create a God out of metal. Think about that. They make a God, they fashion a God, a calf, a bull, out of metal. They traded in the creator for something they created. I mean, is there something wrong with that? There's just something strange about that. The creator is traded in, kind of like an old car, used car, traded in as a used car, and a new one is made, or a new one is bought, a new one is brought in. But not a, not a new creator, but something that's been created. Now, we sit there, I mean, let's be honest, we're sitting here, and we hear this, as far as this story, this event, and we're just like, man, I, I would never do that. That's so stupid. Like, how could you do that? How could you, how could you forget? I mean, here's God. He's the creator. How could you make something out of metal and say, oh, this is God? But yet, honestly, if we look at our lives, we've all done it. We've all traded God for something else. Every single one of us in our lives, we've traded God from time to time, haven't we? I mean, there's been times in our life, that, and, and again, using myself as an example, there's been times, times in my life where I've put God aside, where I said, hey, God, just kind of sit on this shelf. You know, I, I know what I need. I, I need. I need to put my trust in my finances. I just need to make a little more money, and then I can take care of my debt. I can buy the stuff that I want. So God, just kind of hang out. I'll come to you, God, when I, when I really need you, kind of like 9-11, you know, Everything goes awry and everybody's crying out to God because we need God now. But we've all done this in our life, haven't we? I mean, we've all put God on a shelf. We've all traded God for something that we think, that we believe is the answer for our situation or our circumstance. Life happens. It distracts us. We say, okay, God, just kind of settle over there because I really need to work this out. God, right now, you're just kind of bothering me. I really need to work this out. I really need to think this through. I really need to get through this situation. And so we forget. We, we forget the miraculous things that he's done in our lives. Every single one of us can probably look back, whether we are Christian or not right now. We can look back at our lives, and something, maybe a few things amazing have happened in our lives. It just it had to be, you know, maybe we don't even necessarily believe that there is a God, but something you know, stop that, maybe it stopped us from getting into a major accident. Or maybe we were in a major accident and we should have died, and we didn't. But some of us, or, or all of us, could look back and see some of those amazing things that God has done in our lives. And we could easily trade Him in, just like the children of Israel, and say, well, you know, I'm going to, I need to figure this out. 
I, I need to get this taken care of. God, you, you really don't know anything about this. You know, I need to take care of this, God. You really don't. God, I know, I mean, God, let's just be honest. You're single. You're not even married, okay? You, you know very little about marriage. I need to figure this out, right? That's how we do God. We do God like that from time to time, right? And so here's what's happening with the nation of Israel. They just forgot. They forgot God. They create something that they call God, and, and this happens over and over for Israel. <clears throat> Actually, when you get to the book of Judges, you see kind of this roller coaster ride going on with the, with the nation of Israel. It's like they trust God. Oh, God, we love you. You rock, God. And then they forget God. And they turn over to other nations that are worshiping other gods. They turn to their gods and all of that. They hit rock bottom. They're being ransacked by other nations. And, and then they cry out to God and, oh, God, you rock. And it's just like that. And I would venture to say that all of us, myself included, I would venture to say at some point in our life, maybe right now, and, and definitely at some point in our life, we've had that roller coaster ride. Where we were just like, oh, yeah, God, I love you. I'm with you through thick and thin, God, whatever you want me to do. And then we were just like at that place in our life, well, no, God, I want to do my own thing. And you don't know anything about this. And I just want to have fun and whatever. I just want to behave the way I want to behave. And then we walked away. We had that and, and, and just that constant roller coaster ride. And that's what happened with Israel. Now, going back to committing it to memory. I think one of the biggest problems that we have in the church, not just, I mean, it's here at Livewire also, and it's, and it's uh, in every, every church. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is we have a bunch of Christians that are going to church, which is awesome. I mean, we need church. And some people will say, well, I can have church at home and all that, and I get that, especially with technology. We can, have the, we can watch it online and all of that. I get that. That's awesome. But I really believe that there is a specialness to getting a group of people together. And here's one of the, one of the major reasons is because if we're honest, right, Solomon said this, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another man. And if we're honest, we need each other to sharpen each other. You can't get that watching a screen and, and watching the, the video, watching the speaker online. There's nobody around you like, hey, man, can you rub elbows with me? Like, you can't do that. But in this setting, we can do that. In this setting, we can encourage each other. In this setting, we can pray for each other. In this setting, we can, we can lift each other up. And, and in the times where I'm weak, you can be my strength. And in the times when you're weak, I could be your strength. And in this setting, this is why it is so integral. And so going to church, awesome. I believe we should come to church as often as we can. Now, here at LiveWire, we don't, I mean, we don't hound you. You know that Christine and I and our staff, we don't come to you and say, hey, why haven't you been to church? We noticed you weren't at church Sunday. Why weren't you there? How come you weren't there? Aren't you, aren't you supposed to be there? Maybe you need to be there next Sunday, and, and maybe you need to volunteer a couple extra hours to pay for the Sunday that you missed. We don't do that. Now, I know some churches, they do like a roll call, and, and they know. I mean, they're, they're calling like after church service. Hey, where were you? You better get here to the 11 o'clock service. You missed the 9 o'clock service. You better get here to the 11 o'clock. If you're not here for the 11 o'clock, you better get here to the 6 o'clock. We don't do that. But we encourage you to be at church as often and as much as you can simply because it's beneficial for your life and for my life. Now, the problem is this, is we have a bunch of Christians that are going to church, and they think that because I've sat under a pastor that shared the word of God, that automatically my life is going to change now. They think that just by a simple prayer, that, and, and prayer is good, prayer is necessary, absolutely, God answers prayer, there's power in prayer. I'm not saying that, okay? But they just think that, oh, by the simple, the, the simple prayer that maybe Josh prayed at the end, that I know my life is getting ready to change. That my life is going to change because I heard the word of God. I was at church. I heard the word of God, and I prayed, and now I could just walk out of here, and I could just expect change to happen. And it doesn't work that way, friends. See, we've got to do something with what we've heard. We've got to commit it to memory. We've got we've to do something with it. And here's 
where we'll, we'll close out as far as James talks about this in the New Testament. We're going to go to it in, in just a second. And James actually says some of the same things that Moses says in talking about never forgetting and, and never stop living this way and, and committing it to memory. But James actually was the half-brother of Jesus. Now, James, initially, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He didn't believe, actually, until Jesus was resurrected from the dead, when Jesus came back to life. And here is James, years later, he starts to pen a, uh, pen a few things down. Actually, he becomes a major leader. I believe it was the, the church in Jerusalem that he was the, the leader of. Uh, becomes a major leader, a major part in the New Testament church, in the church starting out and, and branching off and all of those things. And so James pens down some very pertinent words for us. He says this, do what God's word says. Notice that. Don't merely listen to it or you will fool yourselves. And this is what a lot of Christians do. We just, oh, well, I heard. I heard the word of God. I heard the word of God. And if we think that that just hearing, now, hearing is necessary, absolutely, but it's the first step. Listening is the first step. To listen to something, to listen to a pos podcast, that's great. That's the first step. To listen to a message online, to listen to an audio book. I mean, it's great. It's the first step, but there's something more than that because all we're doing is fooling ourselves, thinking that life change is going to happen when in reality, we've got to do something with it. Notice he says, if someone listens to God's word but doesn't do what it says, he's like a person who looks at his face in a mirror, studies his features, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. The person that just reads God's word, just listens to it, listens to a podcast, uh, listens to uh, maybe something on, on Facebook, listens to it, reads it online, whatever it is, and then just walks away from it and does nothing to it, nothing with it, is like a person looking into a mirror and they're just like checking themselves out, making sure their hair is in the right place, making sure they got no nose hairs hanging out, maybe checking their ears, making sure there's no ear hairs. Um, popping any zits that are in the way and all of that stuff. But they take care of all of that, and then they walk away from the mirror and forget, oh, what did I look like? What did my hair look like? How did I do that again? And I don't know how some of you ladies forget when you spend like an hour or two making yourself up in front of that mirror. But anyways, James says this is what a person is like that just reads, that just listens, that just hears. If all they do is listen... They're walking away thinking that, oh, life change is going to happen in my life. And they're forgetting what they read. Go back to the notes. One of the ways that we remember is by writing it down. Because we're hearing it, and then we're in a sense hearing it again because we're typing it in. It's like we're hearing it twice, and it just helps us to remember. Uh, another thing that we mentioned was significant events, that significant experiences that have happened in our life. We remember those things. And so they, they, they stick. <clears throat> well, the way that we make those things significant in our lives, as far as God's word goes, and, and for that life change to happen, that God desires for us to live well and to live life to the fullest and to have a long life and to be blessed in every single area of our life, the way that that happens and the way that we can memorize and make it significant is we've got to walk it out. What we hear, what we listen to, we've got to apply to our life. We got to say, okay, God, that's, that's a, the behavior that's destructive from my, this is the good, be okay, so I'm going to start practicing love. I'm going to start practicing kindness. Okay, God, you're saying that all things will work together. All right, I'm going to apply that to my life. All things are going to work together. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm just going to give it to God. I'm going to give him my burden. We take what we see in the Bible, in the word of God, we can't just listen to it. We've got to apply it to our life in order for that life change to happen. Notice he goes on, however, the person who continues, just what we were saying, whoever continues to study God's perfect teachings, his teachings are perfect, life-giving teachings that make people free and who remains committed to them, all right, notice the words continue and committed, memory, uh, remains committed to them, will be blessed. People like that don't merely listen and forget, they actually do what God's teachings say they don't just go listen to a podcast they don't go just read an article they don't go just listen to an audiobook 
They actually listen to it with the intent of, all right, I got something. I've got some, I've got some, uh, I've got an arsenal. I've got some artillery. I've got some bullets. I've got something to, to bring into my life so that I could shoot into the, in the, into the areas of my life that need it. I've got some artillery to go at life at. I've got artillery to battle against sin's temptations. I've got some artillery to battle against life's distractions. I've got some artillery to go into life with so that I could be victorious. And friends, that is what God has in store for us. So see, we wonder, many of you may be here and you may be wondering, well, God, you know, he just hasn't changed my life. He just hasn't brought anything in my life. God just hasn't answered my prayer. God just hasn't um, uh, given me a way out. God is just, God's not blessing me. And it could, I, I can guarantee you this, it's not God. It's not God. And there's, only, <laughs> there's only one other person. It's me. It's you. Are we not only listening but are we taking it and applying it to our lives? So just take today's message, for example. Not only are you hearing it, and I'm hearing it, but when we walk out of here, if we want life change, if we want something to change in our lives, then we've got to take what we've heard and listened to this morning, and we've, and we've got to say, okay, God, I heard it. I want to apply that to my life. We've got to do something with it. And when we do something with it, Notice how when we do something, like when we learn it or when we're, when we're listening to it, it's one thing. But when we actually do it, that's when it sinks in, doesn't it? When we actually experience it, when we actually cook the meal for the first time, then it's like, oh, okay, now, now I know. I know how to do it. And it gets kind of committed into memory. And, and it'll be a process of time. Some things will be a process of time. So the question that I want to ask us is this. Where have I forgotten God? Where in my life have I forgotten God? Where have I said, God, you just kind of hang tight there. I'll figure this out. Where have you and I, maybe have we forgotten God? Because God's got some great stuff for us. And he just simply sa just wants us to put it into practice. And it will bring about the life change that he desires for your life and for my life, for every person that applies his word, the Bible. So the responsibility is on you. It's on me. I've got to get into the word of God. You've got to get into the word of God for yourself. And when you hear that message, you've got to take the responsibility and say, okay, I'm going to do something with it. I'm not just going to hear it. God, I thank you so much for every single person that's here this morning. And I thank you for what we've heard this morning. Now, God, we don't want to just hear it. In, in other words, God, we don't want to just let it go in one ear and out the other. But God, we want to listen, and we want to give that undivided attention to the things that you have spoken to us this morning. But God, we don't want to just leave it there as James pointed out to us, but God, we actually want to do something with what we've heard this morning. God, we just ask this morning that you would give us the boldness, that you would give us the courage, and that God, that you would give us the ability, and that you would speak to our personal lives about how we could take even this very, these very truths and just apply them to our life. And that, God, the things that you speak to us about all areas of our life, that we would take what you say, God, and apply it to our life. God, wherever it is that we might be struggling, wherever it is that we have forgotten you, wherever it is that we have let sin tempt us, Lord, we want to rely on you to speak to our life, but not only speak to us, but, God, to take what you say and walk in it, to apply it to our life, to take the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom you've given us and apply it to our very lives and see the life change happen that you so desire for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give Jesus praise this morning?